Hey guys, this is Chesney Hawks here. You are watching My Hammers 11 with the one and only Russ. Hi everybody, Russ and My Hammers 11. Hope you are all safe and well. If you channel, please consider subscribing, hitting the bell icon so you made of any time we put new content on. As obviously, we like to thank our channel sponsors, Untuck It. Check them out in the description below. Father's Day soon, so you might want to get some. Some nice shirts for the old man, that type of thing. Today, we've got another X Hammer all the way across the world, halfway across the world as well, in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he made first team of three first team appearances for the club, and um, the last one actually was on my birthday. So, there we go. Um, <laughs> Steve Moat, how are we doing, Steve? I'm, I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, we're, we're uh, unfortunately my part of Australia, we're back in lockdown, so we're uh, we're just going for a second week. We've only got five cases, but we're in lockdown, mate. They're so paranoid here. But anyway, we've got to do what we've got to do. Yeah, but I'm not being funny. That's not bad. Yeah, but it's like, you know, we have like how many thousands of cases? And yeah, so five yeah. and it's all shut down. That's what I mean. It's uh, shut, don't take yeah, no shit. shut down. So I got my I got my ISO beard, <laughs> mate. So. <laughs> you don't, don't take no shit. Anyone. That's what I like. That's what I love about the Australian no, the way the government handed it. Any, no shit. That's it. Lock all the borders. Shut no, it no, down. No. And hopefully you'll get yeah. back to some normal. So how, how apart from obviously the lockdown beard, two weeks, oh my heart bleeds. Two yeah. weeks in hot lockdown. Oh my god, <laughs> poor Steve. Poor Steve. <laughs> no, no, how are no, you, man? No, well, what do you do? <laughs> oh, I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm good. I uh you know, a little bit uh you know, a little bit depressed because we are locked down, but uh uh all in all things uh things are going pretty well here. I think uh we're probably Fairly lucky here in Australia with uh, with circumstances around the world. I mean, I've got, I keep a close eye on you guys in the UK, and uh, we're we're fairly lucky here. I think in terms of the fact that we are isolated, uh, but you know, it is a terrible time around the world. It has been for the last twelve months, and and not only just for uh, for what's going on. Uh, I suppose the bigger picture of the the, the illnesses that are that sort of go with this kind of pandemic but for me the thing that i think about and probably my son's going through is only just 12 years old is that it's just constantly stop and start with their football you know like he, he's loving it he plays he loves it and and you know we're shut down another two weeks sort of five weeks into their season and i kind of think about the guys who who are probably starting to get close and wanting to go overseas or try and have a crack at at becoming professionals and and maybe going overseas and giving it a go, you know, you just can't. Where 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 would you go? I mean, oh, that would never have entered our minds that we weren't able to go overseas. You know, maybe we weren't good enough, but you know, the fact that you just <laughs> that you get sort of stopped from doing that, from progressing, is is a shame. And and I'm sure that happens all around the world, not just Australia. But anyway, we hopefully we'll get through the worst and and things can get back to normal. Hopefully, hopefully. We're meant, we're meant to be we're meant to be like all open all doors in two in three weeks time so we'll see i don't think it's going to happen but we'll see that's that's yeah. boris's that's boris's plan the 21st of june apparently is when we can <laughs> so we'll see. Well, just, we'll see just in time for the summer just in time for the summer exactly and and the euros as well just in time for the like all the well, all the second rounds yeah. of the euro so so that'd be good yeah. but we had ten thousand at the, the last game of the season at, at west ham we had, we had ten thousand at the southampton yeah. game so Fantastic. that was great yeah. 10,000 to see a good win. Exactly. See us beat top, go above Tottenham. Yeah. Seems all good to me, man. Yeah, yeah. Seems all good to me. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And obviously, no and obviously bleed, you all good. Yeah. No, no bleed time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had altitude sickness, I think, Steve, to be honest. Or that, you know, we were like fourth. I was like, what's going on here? What's going on here? Oh, bless. Oh, but it's Love fantastic it. to see, though, isn't it? It's, oh, yeah. It's unbelievable to see the boys doing so well. Fantastic. It is it's about man. time as well. Yeah, it is about time. And, and it's, it's funny because actually uh, we, we spoke just before, and obviously you've come dressed for the interview, which I, I do. I, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I'm a big fan of and that. See, you try yeah. this, the Thames Iron Works. It is it is a size too small, but uh, anyway, <laughs> blame lock just blame <laughs> lockdown, blame lockdown, Steve. That's what I always that's do. It. This is the lockdown kilos. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the, that was the last game you was you attended at the at the London Stadium, the Juventus game. 
Yes, yeah, so it, it was the opening of the, the not it was meant to be the official opening, but I think yeah. there was a couple of games before that with uh, Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, I take my I took my family over to Europe and uh, was lucky enough to uh, hook up with Slaven Village, who I still contact with, and he 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 looked after me. There is a story if we got time. Of he, course, he, he Steve, we've got me, plenty got of time. And my son, Fantastic. Well, he got me and my son a couple of tickets, but it was really a, a late because we were traveling all around Europe and we just happened to be in England at the time in London. And I, I, I messaged him. I said, look, I know it's only, a, you know, the game's tomorrow, but there's any chance of getting a couple of tickets. He goes, yeah, I'll find something for you. So it was in the summer, obviously, and it was, an, I don't know if you remember, it was a really nice day. So, mm. you know, I turned up and got my, with my son. He was only eight at the time and went in, asked for the tickets and they gave me the tickets, went to the first security check and, they looked me up and down, and uh, uh, and my son and called somebody over. Yeah, they said, yeah, come through. Went through to the next checkout, and we're getting higher above the stadium, higher and higher. And I thought, oh, we'll have decent t- seats here. And anyway, we ended up in the director's box, and and I met, um, and it was fantastic in the director's box with with all all the big names and and all the Juventus hierarchy. In fact. Um, there was a photo with uh, the security guards kept looking at us for some reason. I don't know why. And you know, I met Slavin the next day for a for a uh, for lunch, and he said, "Look, uh, you know, oh, I said thanks for the tickets." But actually, oh, he he looked after us that night. But the next day, he said, "Look, uh, you know, next time you come to the game, do you think you could wear, you know, some shoes and and some pants, uh, some some trousers as opposed to je- shorts and flip flops?" And I said, "Well." You could have bloody told me you were t- sending me in the director's <laughs> box. I didn't know. I thought I was just going in one of the, you know, behind the dugout or behind the goals or something like that. So I didn't realise we were going to the director's box. And me and my son were dressed in shorts and thongs. And that half, at half time, uh, my son goes, oh, Dad, I'm really hungry, you know. And I go, all right, we'll go for a pie and chips downstairs. We're not going into the uh, into the restaurant there having something to eat. So it was quite a, it was quite a funny episode for us in the end and a little bit embarrassing i think uh for i think it was karen brady who said next time you invite those aussies make sure they know how to dress <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, anyway, oh i love it man it was all good but, uh, but he, he really looked after us and we and he, and he got us down into the change rooms after the game and my son uh and i and obviously julian dix was his assistant i think and um Mm. managed to catch up with him which was fantastic and and uh slavin as you know generous as he is he, he just said to the kit man listen just sort something out for the young fella and you know he threw a whole heap of shirts in and uh and shorts and a couple bit of uh, other memorabilia for my son and it was fantastic so uh oh, so i thought i'd uh i thought i'd put this one on this is actually what they wore it was uh yeah. i think this must have been the old logo was it the, the yeah that the was the, the thames I, yeah the thames iron works pump. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Was, so this was the like that was an anniversary logo, I think. So, mm. yeah, I like the shirt. I did. I like the shirt. It was a good, good shirt. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It's a good shirt. Right. So we, we you sort of. I, so, I've got a couple, mate. On. I'll send you one over. Yeah, send this one over. <laughs> It'll be here by. It'll be in about three seasons' time, based on how the post is working at the moment. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Uh, that's right. right. That's right. So, so you've you've alluded to obviously knowing Slaven and and Julian Dix. Now, for some people, Steve, yeah. they won't. They, they might be too young to remember you. I'll be honest. Some people might be too young to remember you. So um, let's yeah. let's go back. Let's go back. So um, yeah. you signed in sixty not not sixty nine ninety six. You I'm signed in ni- ninety six. <laughs> in 96 <laughs> how did that happen because obviously you were in australia uh for canberra cosmos yeah. uh, and then you end up being at west ham yeah. what what happened yeah so so i connected with uh um oh shit i've just uh i've just said a mental blank with barry silkman so silky yes. who's uh, who was really good friends with how could you forget silky right yeah exactly. so uh, i i connected with silky and uh and I was desperate to come overseas. You know, I spent two years in Italy when I was 16 in, in a team in the Serie A. And, and uh, you know, in Australia, football at that time, it's changed now, but at that time, it was a part-time sport. It was it was worse than non-league. We'd train two nights a week, uh, play on the weekend. They'd be, you know, we'd be playing in, in, in you know, fairly poor and, and unprofessional environments. And, and I just had a will to, to, to uh, uh, you know, to try and get overseas. And, and, and at that time, 
I probably didn't know what else I could do. So, so it was a, it was a level of desperation and, and I managed to get hold of, uh, uh, of Barry Silkman and, um, and he just flew me over. He said, look, I sent him a video, you know, and I had a really good two seasons before that in the top flight in Australia. And, uh, I, I sent him the video highlights and, you know, all video highlights are fantastic, right? You never send shit video highlights. So uh, he, he must, <laughs> he must have seen something and thought, well, you know, so, so he said, look, just jump on the plane and, and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. So at the time he said to me, um, he said to, to the story that he told me was he, he said to Harry Redknapp, look, I've got a, a, a kid coming from Australia, goalkeeper. Can he train with you for a week, set up a practice game and I'll invite some scouts to come and have a look and, and, and see where we can sort of place him. We don't really know where he's at. And that weekend that I was traveling was the weekend that, um, Neil Finn made his debut against Man City when Les Sealy, bless him, bless his soul, yeah. uh, got injured in the warm up. So there was a bit of a goalkeeper crisis at the time at, at, uh, at West Ham. And I think, um, uh, uh, Peter Shilton had just come in uh, yeah. as cover, right? So, so I was flying over and Harry said, look, we, you know, we've got a bit of a situation. Get him here. We'll have a training. We'll, we'll see what he's like. If he's any good, we'll, We'll maybe stick him out. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can invite your your scouts. We'll put him in the game, and 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 you know, hopefully, get something. So, so I went over, and that one week's trial lasted a month, and uh, and in the end, you know, I got I got a deal, which I was absolutely over the moon. But the, the, I'll just tell you a quick story, right? The first training session, I was shitting myself, right? And 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 you know, I've only ever seen these guys on TV, right? So I've come over, and and they stuck me in the first team change rooms. I thought, oh shit! So I've sat down and I'm getting my boots on, and and I didn't want to look at anyone. I didn't want to look at anyone in the eye. So I've I'm putting my boots on, and I look across, and there's a pair of goalkeeper gloves next to me. And I think, oh great, you know, common both goalkeepers. And I look up, and it was Peter Shilton. I fucking fell off, I nearly fell off my chair <laughs> because you know he, he was an idol of mine, and I'm thinking I need to calm down a little bit. I got Peter Shilton sitting next to me, you know, so. It was a, it was kind of a, an intro into uh, into the football which uh, world, which was uh, in the end, it was probably Peter Shilton who helped me get the contract because I think he just liked the way I had a good work ethic, you know. So he, I think, he, and he, he did as well. He loved that sort of stuff. So he liked the way I trained. He liked the way that I, I was and how determined I was, I suppose. And and I think must have put in the good words, you know. So yeah. in the end, I think I did well enough to to get that to get that deal. Fantastic. That's brilliant. It's such, and it's one of those, he says, it's almost like a, it was meant to be, wasn't it? So that sliding doors moment, like the second, like as you were coming, there's a massive goalkeeper crisis, and H was like, hey, we need, we need, yeah. to, we need some cover, man. And uh, I love things like that. It just, everything just seemed that's to just right. work, that's work right. for you, man. But, no, that's right, Russ. But you know, I think football is like that. Football and, and footballers is like that. And, and, and the thing that I tell a lot of kids that I coach and train and and, and, and then give advice to, and even my son, is that you'll always get those sliding door moments, right? You'll mm. always get an opportunity. But but if you can be ready to take that opportunity, and I think I was, I was, you know, because I was so desperate, uh, you know, I think because I was just shit at everything else. So I thought, I'll, I'll, you know, I need to do this. So you've got to be ready for those sliding door moments. And I, and I reckon that story, uh, that chance story is probably... Uh, you know, every footballer has got that story to say, well, you know, if I was, you know, I was in the right, right place at the right time and they needed this guy or, you know, the keeper got injured and I made my debut and kept the spot or whatever, you know, whatever it was. So, uh, but I was fortunate, you know, I, I was lucky. And uh, the fact that my agent and Harry Redknapp were best mates as well probably didn't help. has probably yeah. helped as well, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's, know, all that's, these things that's... sort of fell into place. As soon as you said Barry Silkman, I was like, okay, well, that's, uh, that makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Discussions over the horses. And, and, we'll yeah, exactly. go into that. Yeah, we'll keep that, keep that quote here. Put that, that to the side. But obviously, there was, there, was, there was an Australian contingent as well there as well, because you had, there was you, uh, you had, you had uh, old Laser, you had Lazaridis, you had um, yeah. Robbie Slater was there as well, Robbie wasn't Slater. there? So, so there was a few of you, weren't yeah. there? A the young boy, Chris Coyne, as well. Chris Coyne, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, at, yeah, at yeah. Time. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was a nice. You know, Russ, at, yeah, at, at that time, Russ, you know, um, in Australia, Australia in general, uh, 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 sorry, the EPL in general had a big Australian contingent. You know, mm. uh, you know, I can remember 
we we played we I think we played uh, uh, um uh who was it um geez my memory's gone man uh we played Aston Villa <laughs> yeah. know. it's like it's like so yeah Aston Villa and you had Bosnich there and then we were up at um Blackburn and and um there was another keeper called John Fyland who was there um and and then there was another guy um Frank Taylor. so it was almost like everywhere we went there was one or two Aussies uh, floating around in each team, you know, and mm. and and it's funny because here in Australia they call it the golden generation. You know, that sort of mid '90s teams that that did reasonably well at the World Cup as well. At, at that stage, we actually beat you guys three one at um, at Fulham's ground, and, and we had a really good team: Viduka, Kuhl, um, uh yeah. Lucas Neal, Kevin Musket. We had some really good players, right? And and they keep saying, "Why? Well, where's that golden generation? We're not producing it." And the thing that the fact that is now, right, that if if the the league in Australia was what it was when I was growing up, I don't know whether I would have been that desperate to go overseas because I I I, I could have been earning a decent living here, being a yeah. big fish in a small pond yeah. in a shit league, you know. And I I, I don't want to give it a, a huge disrespect to the A League, but in comparison, it, it doesn't compare, you know, yeah. to, to the top flight Europe. So people like myself and a lot of others had that level of desperation to make it overseas. Mm. And, and and that's what gave us then, you know, so nearly every player in that national team was playing in, in a top flight somewhere, whether it was yeah. the UK, England, Scotland, you know, wherever it was, uh, um, uh, you know, Italy, uh, Germany, wherever. So so you had a fantastic team. and, and But now... Even I see young kids go overseas and after two or three years, they say, oh, you know, we had one kid, you know, I didn't make the AX first team. So he came back at age 19. I go, well, fuck, man, there's not many, you know, players anywhere making the AX first, first team yeah. at 19. You know, so, but but it's the, it's an easy step to come back, Russ. Do you know, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, then they're, then they're big fish in small ponds and we don't progress, I don't think. So it's, it's been great for the for the domestic league, but I don't think for a national team it's been the it's been the best thing. But anyway, mm. no, it, is yeah. it, is. no it's, it makes perfect sense, man. It makes perfect sense. Mm. Um, yeah. And as you said, you know, there's not only was there a good contingent of Australian players in the West around the West Ham squad as well, but in general, I mean, you know, you talk about the golden generation. So sort of, that red nap era to me was a bit like a golden generation for a West Ham fan yeah. because it was you had such an eclectic group of players. Um, and you know, for you guys, particularly, particularly yourself as well, coming into this, you've got, as you said, you've got, you know, Schultz, you've got Les, you've got, yeah. and, and you just got all these training must have just been, yeah, like Moncur, yeah, people like that. Training must have been an yeah. absolute riot. Do you know what, Russ? It was, I, I was, uh, you know, not, not obviously at the time, but you know, a few years later, I was really aware that, that, that I was involved in a league and a team that was kind of changing. You know, players were going from two, three grand a week to 15, 20 grand a week. It was that era that, that, that where the money really started coming in. But then with the likes of Rude Hullet at Chelsea, Arsene Wenger, the, the, the foreign coaches coming in, the foreign players started coming. Yeah. And, and, and Harry took huge advantage of that. And we had players like Paolo Futre, you yeah. know, Dimitrescu, Ratachoy. You know, uh, Mark Reaper, although he was there, Slavin Bilic, you know, came in. So, so it was an ex- really exciting time, and and it was it was an exciting time for a new player like myself to come into a team. But I also saw that it was a bit of a nervy time for for the English boys coming through, yeah. because all of a sudden they're not competing against each other; they're competing against a lot of influx of foreigners. You know, I mean, England's always had foreigners, but I reckon that sort of mid nineties. Uh, there, there was more of these foreigners coming in. Yeah, it was. It Certainly was more into West Ham. Yeah, and 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 uh, I'll tell you a, a real quick story. You know, we we were we were um, doing our preseason in the forest. I can't remember what it's called. Is it High North Forest? High North Forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we were, we started day one doing our our, our preseason, and, and I'd already been there. So that this was ninety six, ninety seven season, and I'd already been there for. Um, uh, six, four or five months, so I knew most of the boys. So I piled in the car with the young lads, you know, getting in the car, and we're all, you know, climbing out of the car from from the training ground. And then the next minute, there's a limo pulls up, and I don't have any. I've heard this story. story. You say it. I've heard this story. Yeah. Jones is yeah. tell me so the story, but I want you to say it. Up. Yeah. 
And the driver, I mean, I'm probably, you know, adding a bit of mayonnaise here, but the driver with his cap pulls up and, you know, gets out of the car and, you know, nice and fresh Paolo Futre comes out of the car ready for his pre-season training, you know, and we're all going, fucking look at that, you know. It's, uh, and it was brilliant. It was brilliant. But uh, he was an interesting character and I got really close with him. And, uh, and I know you've mentioned it, but I've got a re- fantastic, if you've got time, I've got a fantastic story. Well, I think it's fantastic because I was involved in it, but, a great story. He hardly spoke any English, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll move on to it if, that, if that's okay. Is that all right? Yeah, if I tell Steve, this story? Mate, yeah. Honestly, I'd rather you talk than I talk. So I'll, I'm more than oh, happy to sit here and listen. So, um, you know, he spent a lot of time in Italy. And, and my parents are Italian, right? And, and I lived in Italy for a couple of years. So I speak fairly fluent Italian. And uh, and I knew of Sutre because of, you know, he, his... Um, fantastic stuff that he did in Italy, right? So when he came to the club, it was, you know, like another hero turning up to, to, to this club that I was part of. And we become, uh, I wouldn't say we become close. It was more, of, you know, because because we, we got on well, it was more we become close because of necessity, because yeah. I could speak Italian yeah. and he hardly spoke English. So I ended up being his unofficial translator. So anyway, we got... We, you know, all pre-season, get, get through all that sort of stuff. We, we go away, we've got games and all that sort of thing. We went on tour for about three weeks, I think it was, and then we get back and Arsenal's our first game of the season. Now, uh, Ludo McCosco broke his finger in the pre-season game, so I played most of those pre-season games. And he, and he wasn't 100% fit until he had a fitness test before the game. Mm. I was shitting myself already. I was thinking... I might be playing in this game, right? So I was nervous, right? So the day before, uh, we have our final training session and I could hear yelling and screaming walking into the change rooms after the session. And I'm thinking, what's going on, you know? And it's Futre's swearing and, you know, in, in Portuguese though. And, and I went to him, what's wrong? He goes, no, no. He goes, this is not right. In Italian, so he goes, this is not right. This is bullshit. He goes, um, I need to speak to the manager. So anyway, next minute, and I, I just want to keep my head down, all yeah. right? I, I, I'm, I'm already overwhelmed with what the hell's going on, that, that Ludo's got to have this uh, fitness test before the game. And So anyway, Harry comes to me and says, Steve, come in my office. I've got to speak to Paolo, and you need to translate. And I just didn't want to get involved. So anyway, I walk into the, his room, and, and, and he, he sits down, and I sit down, and there's another chair there. And I'm going, where's Paolo? And, and we've got nothing to say, me and Harry, right? We're not, there's no small talk, there's no chit chat, it's just silent. Yeah. And I'm going, and it felt like an hour, and it was like, you know, maybe five minutes. Anyway, he, he walks in, so he wants to make the big entrance. He walks in, he sits down, he goes, right. He goes, you know, he goes, <laughs> Harry goes to me, Steve, ask him what, why he's up so upset, what's wrong with him? And so I ask him, and he says, look, he goes, he promised me. Regard because Paolo had a bad knee injury, right? Yeah, we had a few bad knee injuries, and and Harry, I think, signed him on a on a bit of a gamble that his knee would be okay. And he said, "Look, and when I signed, Harry promised me f- the first five games that he would play me. If I was no good after that, fine." He goes, "Why am I in the first eleven? So I've got to translate back back to Harry." And then Harry's going, "Look." Uh, uh, Paolo, I've been, we've been assessing you. The doctors are saying this, and we think we need you need a couple more weeks. And and, and he just he keeps going. And my Italian, I thought I was good, you know, at Italian, but I wasn't that good, right? And he's yeah. going, and I'm I'm trying to make things up here, you know, saying, you know, and he's swearing at me, saying, you know, he's an f and this, and you you're a liar. And I'm trying to calm the situation, and I, I probably shouldn't have because it wasn't my place to yeah. to change what he was saying, you know. <laughs> In the end, and I, I won't tell you exactly what it, what he said to Harry, but it wasn't good, right? And yeah. and and it, and it it had son and it had other things in there, right? Son of a, and yeah. and anyway, and he stormed out, and then there's dead silence, and I'm sitting there with Harry, and I'm all I'm thinking is, you know, I, I might be playing tomorrow against Arsenal, biggest <laughs> game of my career, and he goes, what did he say? What did he say? I said, oh, Harry, he's not happy. <laughs> We just say that he's not, and, and you know, like I've had to walk out. So the next day we get to the game, and, and there's yelling and screaming in the change rooms, and I'm going, and this is how I remember it. And I don't know if it was exactly right. I'm going, what's going on? And he calls me. I go, fucking not again, you know, Paolo. I've got to get ready for this game. He goes, why am I number ten? 
I go, I don't know, man. John Monker was number 10. I go, I don't know. And I go, he goes, come with me. I go, pal, another, anyway, he goes, he goes, why is he, he wants to know why he's not, boss, he wants to know why he's not number 10. I don't know. I just want to get ready for this game. And apparently him and Monka, because Monka was number 10, did a deal that he could have his villa in Portugal for every Some month for the next 10 years or something like that if he gave him the number 10 and that's how it was about, you know. And oh, he is a kid from Australia stuck in the middle of this uh, <laughs> uh, situation, which I really didn't want to be in. But yeah, yeah looking back, it's quite a, quite a funny scenario, you know. Yeah, but that that just that even that little sort of they just epitomised that whole era for me. That red nap era, it was a bit like a soap opera. Yeah, you know, oh, it was. Yeah, he had these. Yeah. As you said, they had these foreign players came in. We didn't most of we didn't know who they were. Um, obviously, yeah. just before you, obviously that uh, in the same SC season you signed. Obviously, before then, in the in the summer, we'd signed. Obviously, Mister Boogers. Um, so all yeah. that stuff as well. Um, yeah, and also you had these sort of youngsters come in. You had like Rio and Joe, you know, all the, all the, you know Lampard oh. and people like that. Just yeah. a real sort of concophony of, of different things coming through. And, you know, yourself stuck in training. You must have, yeah, every day, you're like, you know, something must have happened. And then Monks, and then we've had Monks on. And, oh, just, oh. He, he's, a, he's a character. And, and I don't know what it was about John Monker, right? But he, he just found it. He found a lot of pleasure in taking the piss out of me. I don't know why, you know. And and, and I was quite a bit bigger than him, so I, I would stand up to him every now and then. But he he just had an ability to get under your skin, you know. And and it's that East End or where he's from North London, I mean. But it's that yeah. that sort of and and it's and it's that um it's those scenarios that most people don't really know that you got to survive those scenarios yeah. because you're yeah, going to yeah. get eaten alive in a change room, mm. you know. And 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 I'd. I was quite lucky that I'd become really close with Slavin Village because he just signed when I was on trial. So we we're in the same hotel and we become really close and we've stayed in touch, you know, and, and, and he was, you know, I was almost, you know, hanging on to his coattails most of the times, you know, he, he kind of looked after me and gave me that little in with the respect of the main boys. Cause you, in football, you don't get the respect of your teammates properly until you play a game. And I was the number two keeper. And until you play and you prove yourself, you're never really in there. You're, you're on the outer, do you know what I mean? You, but, but you're never really accepted as one of the boys until you're actually playing in that first team. Sure. Um, and, but, but he helped me. But, but Monks, you know, he, there's a lot of stories and I'm sure, you know, you've heard them all before, but uh, he was a fantastic player, by the way. Absolutely fantastic yeah. player, yeah. but uh, uh, just a nutcase. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Just in that case, exactly. <laughs> and because when, when I when I interviewed him, obviously he's he's calmed down a bit. You know, he's yeah. bless him. He's a born again Christian and, and stuff like. That. Good luck to him. Okay. And when we started talking, you could see this sort of glint came back in his. He started off quite sort of straight laced, and as we yeah, started yeah. talking, and then it was almost like sort of regression therapy. He was sort of going yeah. back, and you could just see. His, and he was like. And then just this like like verbal diarrhea came out of all these stories, and then I ran naked oh, down here, and I did this, and I did this, and this, yeah, oh yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Love, oh, love he'd, that have, he'd have some some stories as well. I mean, I've heard a few, but he'd have some stories oh, yeah, as well, you know, stories. with the likes of players that he played with as well. But um, fantastic. Yeah, no, no, it was good. It was good. Yeah. So, and obviously, and obviously, you know, you as you said, you, you know, though you were number two, and, I, and we've had a few number twos actually on here. We've had like um, we had Ian Foyer on as well, who was okay, you know, yeah, was, yeah we had Ian on, on and quite a few. Um, and it's, it's it must be one of those really frustrating things being a number two, where you sort of you know you want to you want your team to do well, but obviously you want to play as well. And I think Ian said the same thing. He's like, you know, Ludo was doing so well. He was such a, he was Ludo was Ludo and I wasn't going to, you know, I was going to try as hard as I can and be, as you said, take those opportunities when you, when you were, when you were given them. Yeah. Um, it, it must be like a, a strange thing because obviously you goalkeepers, you, you know, you used to, you go over and train on your own and, and you yeah. know, do your own thing, but you, have this, but you still have this bond, despite the fact you're competing for one place. It seemed that, you know, goalkeepers have a, an incredible bond amongst you. We, we've interviewed loads of goalkeepers here, yeah. loads of goalkeepers yeah. for some reason. Yeah. That, no, Russ, you're right. And and they call it sort of that goalkeeper's union. And I yeah. think it's because, um, you know, when you see a goalkeeper not have a good game, you know what he's going through. Mm-hmm. And it hurts, you know, and you can't hide anywhere. No. And, and so you sympathise with him, right? So, uh, you know, there would... I come across some, some shit characters as well, don't get me wrong, but yeah. 
But most times, most times, like some of my best mates uh, that I've stayed in touch with in football uh, are goalkeepers. And, and it's because you, you end up having that mutual res- respect and and uh, and you can understand everything that they're going through, both the highs and the lows. You know, even though you you wish you want to, you you know, you wanted to play, and uh, and most times, you know, there was never there was never anyone uh, when I played who I thought I wasn't as good at goalkeeper mm-hmm. wise, and that included Ludo. Yeah, yeah. At the time though, at the time Ludo, I just didn't think I was ready because I didn't have that experience. Gotcha. Now, looking back now, he, he, you know, I was kidding myself. He was way better goalkeeper than me. But at the time, that's how that's how I thought, and I reckon that's how most keepers think. Mm. Yeah, I'm better than him. I can I could have saved that. I could have done that. Mm. And, and and I think you've got to have that mentality. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. But without it being arrogant, mm. and, and and that's why I think most keepers stick together and they and 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 they form good bonds while they're together. Yeah. Um, and, and that for the most part is is. You know, all goalkeepers generally think the same way, but you do have your exceptions, and and the exception, uh, I think, is Les Sealy. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, you know, he he was a strange character, but a great guy, and and really generous in terms of, um, you know, like he was coming to the end of his career, but he was still fighting for, to to continue playing, but but he was generous in the sense that sometimes it'd be just me and him training, right? Because we'd be. You know, the, the, the first team would be off and we mean him. And instead of him saying, right, Steve, this is what I want to do, he'd be saying, Steve, I've seen your game and I reckon you need to improve on this, this. Let's work a little bit on that. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, even though yeah. we we're competing for position, he was generous in in uh, in wanting to see me ha- develop and, and help, you know. Wow. Um, but he was a strange character. I don't know. Yeah, I no, just, no, I, no we've, I mean, really... we've, had, we've had Joe and his son on and... Uh... Yeah. And, and Joe sort of may, you know, in the same way how he's generous with his time. I mean, Joe mentioned, you know, obviously they were both, obviously they're living together. In La- yeah. They're both in Loughton. And he made Joe get to the ground on his own. He wouldn't take him to the ground. Um, so like, yeah. Joe, and obviously it's a bit of an ass to get to Chad Reef from Loughton. You have to go to the central line yeah. back into Woodford yeah. uh, and uh, and stuff like that. Yeah, a strange character. But obviously, as you said, he was so generous with his time that, yeah. you know, it's one of those things where... Uh, yeah. And and you you know like um uh, you know you know um and, and how we had the introductions with Danny Norton and I didn't know Danny right and, yeah. and until I until he moved to Australia and and I see I hear Danny speak about him highly and I hear all these other guys speak about him highly and and, and you know I only had a small period of my career with him but I know why they speak like that about yeah. him. You know, but but you know, in but he was a different cat as well. Yeah, he was yeah. a different and, character. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, uh, but but interesting, and it's great. It's great to come across. I mean, Ludo was a fantastic guy. He he yeah, was yeah. unbelievable bloke. You know, he was so so he was so consistent with his with his um character. It was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. But but you know, his his wife and son went back home one week, and he said, "Look, Steve, come with me. We'll have this little pub near our house. Stay the night." We'll have dinner. We'll have a couple of drinks, and then I'll, you know, we'll go back to, to, you know, train tomorrow. So I said, yeah, no problem. And I reckon he did this to everyone, right? All the young girls. He was so got in, had a nice dinner at this pub, and they were, and they knew him really well. And he got me yeah. on these uh, Czech beers, and then he got me on this whiskey, and then he got me on something else. And then the next day, because because sometimes we wouldn't have a goalkeeper coach, so he would drive the session. And the next day, and I reckon he did it on purpose. He he worked me that hard, I was nearly throwing up. <laughs> and he wasn't even breaking the sweat because he was one of the fittest guys in the team. Like, yeah. you know, outfield uh, specimen of a body. And he worked me to the go- I was gone. I was gone. But also gone from, like, like I was seeing three of him. He was, it was like he hadn't had a drink unless he was throwing them in the pop plant. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it was, you know, it was just things like that. It was just a really nice guy, you know. Yeah, yeah, top guy. And then, as you said, as you said, you know, you you signed the club, and then, and then, like, you had these three first team appearances in a week. Yeah, didn't you? So, like... yeah, so, <laughs> I know it was crazy because what happened? I, uh, I actually, we had the 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 two weeks before I played, uh, we were away at Leeds, I think it was. Yeah, and and Harry pulled me in before the game and said. um, Steve, you got a chance to go uh, on loan, and we we really want to see you playing, right? And yeah. and 
I said, no, I actually didn't want to go because it was at Crew Alexandra. And they were, they were like two divisions below at the time. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and I didn't want to go. And I actually sat down with Slavin after dinner. He said, Steve, go. you got to go. He goes, you've got to play. doesn't matter that, that it's two leagues or whatever it is. He goes, just go and play. So I caught the train from Leeds up to Crew. That was a shock of my life. And I played there the next day. So I played the Sunday. Then I played Wednesday midweek. Then I played Saturday away at Bournemouth, all for crew. And then yeah. we, were, then I got a call um, from uh, the guys at West Ham saying, "Listen, Ludo's injured. You got to come back. You got to play for us." And and in the last game that I played, I actually injured myself. My, I hurt my shoulder, and and I was thinking I might need a week off, right? And again, I went to Slav and I said, "Slav, I got this. You know, like oh, my shoulder's gone, mate." He goes, "Steve, just play." He goes, you might not get another chance. And he was right. So I ended up having a fitness test the morning of the oh, of yeah. the cup game against Barnett. And it was hurting me. And and I went, I just got to do it. So I ended yeah. up playing that night. And, you know, I don't know if you remember the game, and I'm sure most people do. I, I, I let a shit goal in one of the first opportunities. A ball, you know, guy had a shot come off my chest. They scored one nil down. And I, I was gutted. And then the next minute, it was like a lob come into the box, like easy, uncontested. And I caught the ball, and and there was a huge cheer, like huge cheer, yeah, from our fans. And I'm going, what? I'm going, what's happened? And it was a sarcastic cheer that I caught the ball. <laughs> and, and like I'm going, what have I done? You know, luckily we we come out of that game with a draw. I, I made a couple of good saves second half. And then we went away and played at Forest away, and I had a blinder. It just worked yeah. for me. I had an absolute blinder. Um, and, and then we played the second leg at home, and we won, I think, 1-0. Yeah. And then, you know, Luda had his fitness test the following week against Liverpool. And I was thinking, I've got to play this game, man. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and he had the fitness test and played. You know, I would have loved to have played that game, but, you know, that's how things work out. And then that's kind of what led me to, to, to push to, you know, to go – on loan again, you know, and I, I didn't want to leave West Ham. I wanted to stay. And my agent said, uh, Silky said, look, Steve, there's Reading have just had an injury to their, um, their keeper. Um, and, uh, they're desperate for someone, you know, they're going to come down and watch your reserve game. And he said, <laughs> he said, listen, they really need someone who commands the area, who organizes. He goes, whatever you do, you know what Silky's like. I don't know if you've ever met him, but he goes, what if I won't try and put his accent on. He goes, whatever you do, just shout, just keep shouting the whole game, right? And, and he reckons I was shouting at my left back and he wasn't even there. He was like tucked in, I'm shouting, hey, yeah. I just shouting at everything. And and, and the first thing uh, Jimmy Quinn was, it was Jimmy Quinn and, and uh, um, I can't remember the other coach's name. He goes, geez, he talks a lot, doesn't he? He goes, yeah, he does. <laughs> he does. So, you know, I ended up uh, then going there on loan and, and doing really well and ended up, you know, signing there, which... Like yeah. I said, I was I, I was actually gutted because I felt I, I could have offered something to to West Ham as a club, and I was sure. just you know I was twenty five when I come over, so mm. I was reasonably old, you know, and, and I probably needed a couple of years to bed myself in, you know. Um, but that's the way it works, and 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 I you know I enjoyed a a good time before my injuries at at Reading, and yeah. uh, and you know played at, at Wolves and Palace as well. So you know when I look back, I kind of. You know, I'm really happy with with the way things worked out for me, but um, I, I would have loved to have stayed a little bit longer at at, at West Ham. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and something I ask a lot of a lot of players. So obviously, you know, obviously you play for West, you West Ham and Reading and you know, Wolves and Palace. When you know, do you do you look out for all those results when like when they come on the telly? You know, do you watch those games? Do you have an affiliation with those clubs that you you played with? Yeah, de- uh, more so uh, West Ham and Reading. Good answer, Steve. Uh, Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, more so those two. I mean, Reading, yeah. Reading was probably because I also spent, um, you know, almost eight years living there because I was I stayed based there even when when I went to Wolves and 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 Palace and I went to Gillingham as well and played a bit of non-league. So I kind of stayed and based at Reading. So mm. I used to go and watch a lot of their games and and a lot of my good friends are still from, you know around that area. So. Yeah. But but definitely definitely those two clubs are the clubs that I look out for the most and and my son now is just starting to understand um, the uh, I suppose the the achievements that I had um, and uh, and so for him 
because West Ham's in the EPL, he he then only associates me with West yeah. Ham and yeah. and says, "Oh, West Ham are playing, you know, Man United." You know, Dad, you, that that was one of the games you you were involved in, you know, and and sometimes you'll ask to look at the books and all that sort of stuff. So it's oh. great, you know, and 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 uh, th- that's uh, you know, it's uh, West Ham's that kind of club though, not just for someone who's played for them. I think for most people, it's kind of their second favourite club. Um, it, it, it's a, I think it still has that attitude of being a family club as well. You know, I mean, I don't know what it's like now at the new stadium. I know they've had their their challenges, but um, you know, I think it's always been a club like that. Yeah, and I think I think I think in the last eight, eighteen months, I think since since Mister no, say the last season really, since Mister Moyes has, has taken the helm, it, there's this there is a a changing attitude. It, it does seem amongst the fan base. It, it, I know what's happened in the global pandemic has been an awful. Awful, awful time yeah. in the world for everyone. It's actually, I think it's helped West Ham fans re- reconnect with the club a little bit, to be honest. Um, oh, and, yeah. and you know, there's a team there which which is working hard. Um, obviously, you know, in the nosebleeds in terms of our yeah. positioning. But as you said, yeah, it's always... And actually, you know, I've interviewed you know, lots, lots of ex-players and they all say how much they enjoyed their time and, and it was like a family club. And, you know, once or yeah. twice would have been sort of normal. But everyone saying it, you know, you sort of realise. And obviously we interviewed fans, we interviewed those in Australia, we interviewed those in India and America and yeah. all over the goddamn world. And we're this funny little club in East London, um, they all support. So, you know, yeah. they're doing something right uh, I think it's I think it's, you know, the areas are uh, an area of battlers, you know, of yeah. people who kind of, get get stuck in and have a go you know the old markets and all that sort of stuff market traders and i think that that's probably where where it it maybe comes from you know yeah. everyone wants to see yeah, everyone loves to see an underdog as well so you know and, and then west ham have had some fantastic players over the years as well that's i mean the 66 world cup really that that exactly. west ham won <laughs> so, okay, yeah we won the um, world cup exactly <laughs> yeah so no, no, it was, it was good. It was good. Speaking it was good of, times, great memories. It was, yeah, and I, I mean, and, and sort of that period was a bit of that sort of red map era. There was a, a, a number of prolonged, it was a relative prolonged success in West Ham's modern history. Um, you know, shortly yeah. after you left, obviously, then we got to the Intertoto Cup final in '99, and you know, we won that, and you know, we, you know, we was doing a you know, fifth, we, our highest ever Premier League position, and stuff like that. So, yeah. um, it was, it was, a, it was a funny time. Um, speaking of players, speaking of players, obviously, yeah. everyone we get on the channel, we try and get to do an. 11. Funny enough, Harry Redwood yeah. didn't do one. Oh, Harry he didn't, didn't do his 11. No, he was too busy. He had, he had another call. What a surprise, Harry was taking another call an hour late. Yeah. <laughs> and he started talking about, and he started, bless him, he started talking about Bobby Ferguson and then he, he just yeah. he talked about, waxing lyrically about Bobby Ferguson and then he just ran out of time. So, everyone we get on the channel, we, we get to do a, an 11 to put together an 11 of the play, for the ex-players, um, it's uh, it's an 11 of the players you played with and trained with as well because obviously, you know, a lot of games you you, you, you trained as well as played with. So, yeah. um, that's what we try and do. It's only, only a bit of fun. It's only a bit of fun. Um, um, no problems. I've, I've actually written it down, and I, I've got a couple, uh, couple extras as well. A few subs. Yeah, How's that? I've yeah. even got some subs there. No, you, you can, you can <laughs> I, tell. Unfortunately, you're... I didn't. I didn't make the cut, but anyway, ah. <laughs> could have got those appearances back up then, Steve. Right? Okay. Oh, that's it. Exactly. exactly. Who's in goal then? Who's in goal for the Steve? So Ludo's in goal. Yeah, Ludo's I can in goal. That. But I've got two subs, right? I've got two two yeah. goalkeeper subs. I've got Les Sealy and uh, and Peter Shilton. So you know those. Those three there, at, you know, that were the time, the time I was playing and and uh, uh, that were just a huge influence on me in terms of just, you know, I suppose it was a, I was a little bit overawed as well because I only ever used to see them on TV, you know. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, I had a close connection and, and, a, and a good connection with each of them individually and as a group yeah. as well. I think we, we all worked together and worked together well, so. Loads of experience, um, yeah. right? Okay. Uh, in defence, so, who's, yeah. who's your first defender? Yeah, so I've got uh, Julian Dix as oh, a fullback. Yeah, good old Julian. He, so, so Julian used to get me. Dixie used to get me before training, and he'd go, "Right, come on, we're going to go and have." And, and he wouldn't warm up. I don't know if you know this. Nah. He, yeah, he yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had him. Never used to warm up. So he would say, "Right," and, and you know he was famous for his free kicks and his penalties, right? Uh, and it wasn't that he was like a, a Beckham where he'd, you know, bend it like Beckham. He'd just smash it, right? So he'd go, come on, Steve, we're going out early today. I'd go, fuck. Go, oh, oh, 
Because you know what? I knew I wouldn't get a warm up because he doesn't want to warm up, so he doesn't want to waste any time. So I'd have to jump in goal, and he would just smash the balls at me for half an hour, <laughs> and I'd be trying to make saves. And I, so, uh, so Dixie was uh, fullback, uh, Slavin Bilic, and he's my captain as well. And you know, because I've been yeah. so close with him, so Slavin and and Rio Ferdinand. So Rio was only coming through, right? Uh, he'd only played one or two games. Uh, I think yeah. while I was there, he went on loan to to uh, uh, Bournemouth, but. Uh, I've got to put Rio in there for what he's done after, you know, after I'd sort of uh, influenced his career. <laughs> uh, no, after, well, we used to get a lift into the ground. He used to get a lift into the ground with me because we lived fairly close. So, no, so Rio's uh, uh, and Billich at the back and, and Steve Potts oh, I put in I there Steve because, Potts. because he, you know, I played a lot of reserve games with Potts. He was coming towards the end of his career as well. Mm. And, and whether he played first team or whether he played reserves, he had the same attitude. His his professionalism was unbelievable. Another guy was Tim Breaker. He was the same, right? Professionalism yeah. was unbelievable. If he got put in with the stiffs in the reserves, even at training, he'd be the one leading the line. And 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 he kind of showed me not, not he didn't do it intentionally, but from my observation, he showed me what a professional is, is about. You know, and yeah. I would love to see him in his day. So. So they're my they're my uh, defenders and nice. uh, and another one I wanted to mention I, I only played a couple of reserve games with him was Alvin Martin um, he, he left the the year so I signed the end of ninety so I signed in January of trial signed in March ninety six yeah. and then signed and then you know carried on so I played sort of three months at the end of that year and and he was you know obviously coming to the end of his career played a few reserve games and but he had a deep voice big man you know uh, like he was just but but he was a gentle giant as well you yeah. know and and again he was one of those guys who'd sit with you uh, you know at lunch and just have a chat to you and sit, ask how you're going and stuff like that he was he was a gentleman as well um so that the the it was my uh, my sub in in the as a defender nice nice god let's move yeah. into midfield and lo- loving the t- this, uh, this is this is so my era steve it's unbelievable god yeah God. fantastic so so my, my midfield, and I don't know how I'm going to play. I'm going to mention this guy, and I was fairly close with him, but I just thought he was an exceptional player, Daniel Williamson. Oh, he, oh. He, he was skillful, cool. skill-wise. That, that kid there, right? He was a few years younger than me, but that kid, he was unbelievable. You know, I think he, his career ended with, with, uh, uh, with a lot of injury, right? Yeah. But not just a nice guy, but what a player he was. I mean, you could have stuck him in, in any of the European leagues and he would have fitted in. He was just mm. such a skillful, great player. So I got Danny Williams in there. Bish was similar. Ian Bishop, he, he was a fantastic player as well, ball player. But he had a good engine on him as well, man. He was box to box. Oh, yeah. um, and, and I've got Stan Lazaridis in there in the midfield, wide on the midfield. Uh, and, and then Frank Lampard as well. You know, you can't go oh. past what he did what he did in his career. Again, he was, he was, uh, I, I, I'll tell you a really quick story, right, about Barry Silkman. You know, Lampard used to come on for five minutes nearly every single game, come on five minutes to go. Yeah. And then the shout started being, he's only doing that because of his dad and he's, you know, getting his, and, and, and Harry go uh, and, and Barry Silkman goes, I remember having a chat with a few other players at the Swallow Hotel and, uh, and uh, Silky goes, if he becomes a player, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> and, then, and and I'm thinking now, did I choose the right agent? I don't know. I don't know. Did I? Because because Frank was has been one of the all time greats, right? And every now and then I say, Silky, what's that hat taste like, man? <laughs> that was a great call. But so so I got you know I got four at the back, four in the no. midfield, which no. is uh, Lampard, Lazaridis, now Stan. You know Stan, right? Whenever he had the ball and he was running at players. You could actually see the fear in the players' eyes. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They yeah. didn't know where he was going. He was unbelievable at uh, running with the ball, running at players. Um, so Stan, uh, Frank Lampard, Ian Bishop, just ahead of John Monker, and John Monker is on the bench, and Danny Williamson. Nice, nice. And, Danny Williamson. And then my front ball. two, yeah, my front two, it's got to be Paolo Futre. I've got to put him up front, man. <laughs> You know, the guy, he was finished when he came to West Ham, although he did sign at Atletico Madrid after us, right? But but if ever you get a chance to see any of his any of his highlights before his injuries, mate, he was he was an unbelievable player. Ma- massive, massive player. And then the other guy who I, I spent a bit of time with, only a little bit of time, was Tony Cotty. Yeah. He's my other striker. 
Oh. And and Tony is interesting because um, uh, Tony used to do shooting practice. He'd always say to me, Steve, stay back. I want to do more shooting, more shooting, more shooting. And he was shit at training. He, like I, could, I, I, I don't know whether I just had the measure on him, but mm. but he could hardly score. And I remember one day he's walking off. He goes, oh, I'm in negotiations for a new contract. He goes, I've got to score at least two goals this weekend. Uh, otherwise, I'm not getting my contract. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to score my two goals and get my contract. Right? And I'm thinking, he's just, he hasn't stuck one past me. The whole the whole session, he was shit. I go, I feel sorry for this guy. He's not going to get it. And he's, I can't remember which game it was, but he, he scored two goals. Uh, but but that's what he did. He did it in the, he, he scored goals in the big games as well. Uh, so, you know, those two are up there. And, and my sub is... Uh, the almighty and fantastically looking Danny, the Portuguese. Oh. And, and, and I've only got Danny in there because, look, Danny was, he was a bit of controversy and he was a great, great young player. But mm. what I liked the best about Danny was he used to take me out to the club right? and I'd hang off his coattails. The guy was unbelievably good looking. Right? And I used to just sit there and just, you know, absorb everything that was coming. I was like the cricketer, you know, when the slips go on, yeah, yeah. I'll have whatever's <laughs> coming around. It's so. chopping off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so Danny's on the bench. So I'll just oh, go brilliant. through. So Ludo and Glow. I got it. I got it, it, man. There it is. Oh, you got there it. it is. Oh, fantastic! How yeah, good there that? it is, man. Love yeah. it. Love yeah. it. That is so like yeah. Love it. That's like that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I love that team. Brilliant. It's like they fantastic. they say they say when, when when you're like a teenager, you're that's when you you love like the music you love is the music you listen to when you're a teenager, and I think it's same true yeah. with football footballers. So when I was a teenager, you know my footballers were Bishop and Lampard and uh, Moncur yeah. and you know and and these guys, and so yeah, I, I love it, man. That's a great team. Yeah. And actually, Futre, exactly. the only other time Paolo Futre has appeared is in Steve yeah. Jones's eleven as well for the exact same reason you did. Oh really? Jonesy did exactly the same as you. Yeah. Yeah. So Jonesy was uh yeah, he would have but because he was you know, like our training and stuff. I don't know if you remember, uh, I think it was our third game of that season, it may have been or fourth against uh, Southampton at home. He, 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 and that's where he showed his brilliance. Yeah. I don't know if you yeah. remember that, but yeah. It, it it was that it was that glimpse of what he was able to do, but just he just couldn't do it because his legs no. were gone. Yeah. You know? But but you know training with him and stuff you see you see what he was like it was unbelievable. Yeah, Steve, man, it's, it's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Oh, no, thank friend. you. Just, you know, Love like I, I don't know how worthy I am of being on here. You know, I only played a couple games for the, the three games for the Hammers and and uh, a Steve, short man, stint, but uh, it's great. Some great memories of mine, uh, Russ. You know, uh, over the years and and you know I, I remember walking off the West uh, the 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 game that I played against uh, Nottingham Forest. And, and Julian Dix come up to me, gave me a big hug, and I think there's a photo floating around. And, and I said to myself, you know, no one, no, now, whatever happens now, nobody yeah. can take away the fact no. that I've played in the EPL. And, no. and, and that's, you know, one of my proudest moments, you know. Um, and and that's it. Yeah. You know, and uh, like I grew up, I grew up on a, in, in a regional area in, in Australia where, you know, I was on a farm. There was, the, the next house was like a, a, a mile away. And, and and when I think back to from where I come from to, and it's all relative because there's other players in my era who you know who played four five hundred games, yeah, you know, sure. you know. But at the end of the day, we all take away what we did in in, in our careers, and and uh, and I'm you know I'm proud of what I did. I, I probably overachieved, uh, but but the the thing that got me, I think, was I had a decent work ethic and and you know I had a desperation about wanting to do what I what, yeah. what I ended up doing. So. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. And I'm glad that, and, that West Ham picked me, you know? Yeah, totally. and also I think, you know, when you say, oh, I only play three times, Steve, there's millions of players or, or, or fans around the world who would change their life or give their life away to do one, to have played once yeah. West, for West Ham. So yeah. I know what you mean. But it, it doesn't matter if you played one or you played 799 like Billy Bonds did. You know, yeah. it, you know, it, you've you did something which a lot of people would have loved to have done, and so that's why I love. It doesn't matter, you know. We, I mean, we interviewed those those are the youth team guys who never really broke into the first team, like yeah. you know, from the night ninety nine. You know, I mean, we've had you know various and and just to, just to be around that time, and you know, and I think that's why the fans love watching these things because it's great, man. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. Um, no, and obviously, no problem. my pleasure. Absolutely, uh, yeah, it's been brilliant. And absolutely, obviously, thank you to everyone for watching as well. Um, whatever you do, yeah. give it a share, give it a like, give it a subscribe. And for myself and for Mr. Steve, take care, everyone. Stay safe. 
wash those hands, get those jab appointments when you get your, your jabs. Uh, come on, you irons, and we'll see you again yeah. very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Up the Watch hammers. Up the hammers. Come on, you irons. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.